Thank you for being a part of our study. Uh, we're doing a new study, started it yesterday, dealing with morning meditation and an evening meditation. I hope you'll try it out. Uh, I personally need a little encouragement to do that evening time, and uh, I hope that you'll join me in doing both morning and evening. Uh, when Josh Monk was teaching Sunday school, he would sometimes go ding, 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 real talk alert. And uh, I loved when he did that. And I'd like for us to think about that, particularly as we study the morning meditation around Jonah. Uh, Jonah wasn't the first, and he certainly won't be the last person to pray a 911 prayer. God arranged for a big fish to pick him up, and while he rode in the belly of that fish, God transported him from his trip to Tarshish all the way over to the Assyrian border. Jonah didn't know it was a taxi ride. He thought he was going to die. And so he prayed in chapter 2 some things. It's really interesting to contrast what he said in chapter 2 with what happened in chapter 1. Jonah recorded his retreat from uh, obeying God's plan for his life in chapter 1. In verse 3, it says, But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. In the belly of a great fish, he seemed to forget that he had run from God's presence, and he longed for the connection that was lost. In verse 4, it says, then I said, I am driven away from your sight. How shall I look again upon your holy temple? Now just, just in case you're wondering, Jonah wasn't driven from God's sight. He ran from God's presence. But if I have to be honest with myself, <laughs> there have been plenty of times when I've done the very same thing. So here's our first real talk question. When did I, ask yourself, when did I last leave God's presence because I refused to follow his directions and then I needed him in a time of crisis. Well, thank God he heard Jonah's prayer. He heard Jonah's prayer out of love and compassion for Jonah, but also for the people of Nineveh. And what's interesting is the people of Nineveh, that Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria, and they were hated enemies of probably everybody in the region, but certainly the Israelites. So, Tony, why don't you read about what Jonah prayed? Jonah prayed, and God provided his needs. He prayed, I called to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol, I cried, and you heard my voice. So, real talk, question number two. Who are my enemies? And I've just given you a list that came to mind. Are they people of different races? Do they have different political views? Are they different nations or nationalities? Maybe they have different sexual orientations. Are they people who've shown hatred to me or a dislike toward me? Who are they? Fill out your list. And then talk to God about his love for them and ask God to help you love them the same way he does. Well, Jonah's failure did not eliminate him from service. Once he was delivered by the great fish to the shores of Assyria, God spoke to him a second time and said, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. This time Jonah obeyed God's directions. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. So here's real talk question number three. I'm going to say this to myself. You say it to yourself. What has God told you to do, but you've refused to follow his directions? What is keeping you from following his guidance? And when will you agree to follow him? Talk to him about that. Well, that's the morning meditation. The evening meditation, we're going to shift to the New Testament and look at the first chapter of 1 Corinthians. Paul described in verse 10 his purpose for writing the letter. He wrote, Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all be in agreement, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. 1 Corinthians is full of a lot of great information. But the number one thing he wants to do by giving us all that information is to have us be united. United in actions, united in attitudes. Now for this, just pause just for a minute and ask God this. Lord, 
thank you for giving us a spirit of unity among the churches, Englewood Assembly of God, Kairos Church, Maywood Church, and Revive Church down the street. Those churches on Winter Road, pastors are working together. Thank God for that. And then ask God to magnify that much further. Well, the church in Corinth was divided because of self-interest, and it was disguised as loyalty to leaders. A little reading of their division reads like this. I, even I, belong to Paul, and I, even I, belong to Apollos, and so on, in 1 Corinthians 1.12. The report from Chloe's people to Paul was that the big I was the root of division, self-will, self-centered motivations, self-pleasing, self, self, and more of self, had eroded the unity of the church. As we read through 1 Corinthians, we'll find some glaring issues of self. So there was sexual perversion. Uh, there was an argument between people that couldn't be settled by a Jesus kind of life. Uh, there were all sorts of divisions between the rich and the poor that even showed up while they were taking the Lord's Supper. So again, it's a good time for us just to pause and to pray. And let's ask God, what role does God want us to play in promoting unity? How does our speech, how does our things that we post in social media, how can that promote unity rather than division? And how can we make sure that our lives are not full of self-will? Now, as I say the word you, I also can say the word me. How can I do that also? Now, Verse 18 is a tightly packed verse. Tony's going to read it, and I'll talk about it. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. <clears throat> so if I were to say the F word right now, you all would, oh, all right? But when Paul used the word cross, it actually had more negative connotations than any curse word in our vocabulary. Uh, in fact, there was a time when a riot was started among slaves when one slave turned to another slave and said, you ought to go to the cross. Can you imagine that? Why? Because the cross was the most awful, shameful, horrific way to die in that time period. And that word had horrible pictures. I can't imagine people getting little necklaces with a... Uh, with an electric chair around it or uh, a noose around it. We wear crosses to symbolize something that was horrific, but now has meaning to us. And Paul talks about that. The message of the cross is good news to us and we can wear it as a symbol of God's grace because God defeated his enemies on the cross by turning them into his friends. He was able to forgive us of our sins to give us new life, and to become personal to us through what Jesus did for us on the cross. With that in mind, let's again pause. And as we end our, our day and our evening with the Lord, let's spend some time thanking him for the cross, thanking him for what Jesus has done for us, thanking him that he didn't just squash us and be rid with us, but rather he won us over through the shed blood of his son on the cross. Thanks for being a part today. God bless you. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow.